we're starting with a session on dioptric distress. Uh, a bio and in this uh, session, we'll be discussing the biometry solution for all kinds of eyes. And basically, the purpose of the cataract surgery nowadays is a refractive cataract surgery. So we have to target the best corrected visual acuity unaided as 6 by 6, or even better than that, to up, up to a level of 6 by 5, 6 by 4, as we call it as eagle's eye vision. So this is what we're targeting. And we'll be discussing all the issues related to different types of eyes, different types of scenarios, what should be the precautions taken in each type of uh, case. And that would we try to like to cover in, in the entire, uh, uh, this uh, entire instruction course. Hope any and all of the people who are present here are free to ask any questions related to that. Thank you. So I am the first speaker. So I'll be starting with uh, the pearls and uh, perils of the basic in basics in biometry. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be talking of biometry and the basics, pearls, and the perils which you should be taking after this session. Uh, we are, as we all know, what is biometry? It is a process of measuring various parameters of the eyes and using this data to calculate the ideal intraocular lens power for that particular patient. First thing is what you have to do is to gather a good data. So how do we gather and what are the points, important points to be gathered? So important components, some of which are essential, some of which are additional. Essential obviously is the excellent and the characteristic readings. While the newer formulas even require nowadays the AC depth measurements, white to white measurements and the lens thickness. Who should be doing the bi biometry? Remember it's a matter of great responsibility of the, for the surgeon. So ideally, Every surgeon should try to do his own biometry, or you should have a very well-trained assistant who does it for you. When it should be done, it should be done early so that it gives you an appropriate time to calculate the IL power. This is especially useful when you have odd pass, very low pass or very high pass of IELTS, so that you can give time to the company to arrange them for you, and time to counsel the patient what type of refractive correction does he want. Are you aiming for an emetropia in such cases, or are you leaving him with some residual refractive error? Cratometry, as we all know, is the estimation of the corneal power. A good K measurement is important, not only directly for the IL power calculations, but indirectly it has a role in the estimation, in the estimation of the effective lens position. And obviously the estimatic correction, since we, as I told you, is a refractive cataract surgery nowadays, obviously you have to counter the pre-existing estrianism also by a cataract surgery. There are various modalities. I'm not going to the de details of which, which you can use to take the uh, cratometric readings. Remember the tips and the tricks while taking any cratometric readings is please calibrate whatever instrument you're using, calibrate it regularly. Ensure that is a very good tear film. It is an untouched cornea when you're doing your basic readings. You should not have used any applination or any pro contact procedure before that. The, uh, accurate centration is important. Please always occlude the other eye of the patient and ask the patient to fixate on the fixation light and take average of multiple readings. It should be a dark room. If there is an evidence scarring, then obviously in those cases, you can use the other eye values. And always, always recheck if you get extreme values of less than 40 diopters or greater than 48 diopters, or if there is an asymmetry of greater than 1.5 diopters. For excellent measurements, either you can use the ultrasonic modes or you can use the uh, optical uh, method. Uh, ult uh, ultrasound, obviously, as we know, all is based on the ultrasonic waves, which are reflected from the various ocular structures. And these echoes are then deciphered to yield the uh, distances which are traversed by the uh, uh, ultrasonic waves. Remember, while doing the contact ultrasound, please, again, for any ultrasonic machine also, please calibrate your machines at regular intervals. Use the correct velocity settings. Again, it should be gentle touch. You do not want an application indentation effect to come. Look for good spikes. Remember, the spikes should be at least 90% reflectivity should be there for each uh, echoes. Appropriate gain settings according to the density of cataract. And always, again, align using the fixation light. Take average of multiple readings again, and the standard deviation between each reading should be less than 0.06 mm. Repeat if there is a difference between the two eyes of, or greater than 0.3 millimeters. 
always prefer to do it before you have dilated the pupil because obviously in such cases the fixation goes off fire uh, goes off way and obviously that can lead to erroneous readings avoid using any ointments before you do these measurements uh, the pros and cons of using a contact ultrasound pros would be it is obviously easiest to perform works for the density of the cataracts obviously the ultrasonic machine is cost effective as compared to an optical biometer but the disadvantage is that it causes a it can depending on the user can cause a corneal compression leading to indentation effect and leading to a false reading or a fluid bridge which can give you erroneously increased exit length risk of abrasion infection is always there and misalignment issues can happen the disadvantage these disadvantages which i mentioned can be overcome by using an additional pregus shell so that we go switch on to the immersion technique this shell is basically created uh, is basically used between the two eyelids and a water bath is created between this shell such that the tip of the probe always remains immersed in it so this is a photographic uh, thing how the pregus shell look, looks like but remember in this case uh, the patient has to be supine not exactly supine but it has to be slightly in the uh, reclining position but remember while doing in an immersion mode when you're keeping the pregus shell again the alignment of the shell on the mark on the shell should be properly done fill the chamber adequately there should be no air bubbles in between again the probe inside it should be totally immersed in the water bath and the patient should be looking into the fixation light and the most common thing which you have to remember the most important thing which you have to remember please change the mode on the ultrasound machine because people do to uh, tend to do it in the uh, using the pregus shell in the immersion mode without changing into the immersion mode on the machine so that can give rise to erroneous readings don't keep it in the contact mode there is a thing which there is a probe uh, there is a uh, press button on the machine so please change that obviously this increases accuracy if you use the immersion method because there is no corneal compression again other advantages of the ultrasonic uh, machines as for the it can work for the density of cataract and obviously it is relatively cost effective you just need to add on a pregus shell to your basic ultrasound machine there may be a slight learning curve a special shell is needed but these i would not consider as major disadvantages to the procedure obviously optical biometer has a uh, uh, edge over the ultrasonic uh, measurements of the exit length based on the principle of partial coherence interferometry it has gives you a better resolution since the wavelength of the infrared rays which are used in this case is better than that of the ultrasonic waves again while the important tips which you have to do uh, remember while doing uh, optical biometry is basically remember that you ensure a moist ocular surface ensure an alignment of the patient in, in the visual axis choose the correct mode and in these cases especially when you have a slight psc a slight midrisis may be helpful it's a very very uh, observer independent instrument so very high repeatability of the measurements is there fast precise and the same machine can be used for doing the multiple measurements including your keratometric readings your ac depth your white to white lens thickness everything can be measured on the same machine it, uh, again there's no physical contact no anesthesia is required there's no risk of corneal compression or any risk of any uh, infection or abrasions however it is more expensive than the ultrasonic machine and does not work if there is significant posterior posterior subcapsular cataract once the data has been gathered the next step which we have to do is to you choose the formula now there are a list of formulas in the market the only thing remember srkt2 is now obsolete why because there are certain steps at which it shows uh, show sudden jumps one of the examples i have given here for example if the exit length is around 22 in this case i'll part calculated using the above keratometric values and the a constant would be around 22.95 however if the same thing exit length is differing only by 0.01 mm that is it is 21.99 and you will have a, you will land up with a difference with using the srk2 with a difference of 1.03 diopter in your i'll part calculations so there are four readings where this jump takes place so that's why the srk2 is an obsolete formula because it gives you very very nice readings at this specific range of exit length so which formula to use and where there are now many various formulas which are available for short eyes it is hoffer q was said to be the best but now even hagee's and holiday 2 uh, which is there available uh, in um, isle master and obviously available as a software which can be purchased uh, online then we have average for average eyes you can use any of the formulas the barrett is now being imported in most of the optical biometers and for the long eyes barrett olsen hagee's and i, I think my uh, next speakers will be talking about the long eyes and the short eyes separately which formulas work best for them Like this is basically you should just remember there are various types of file formulas some of which are based on virgins some of which are based on ray tracing and some of which are based on artificial intelligence the hill rbf is the one which is based on artificial intelligence still even after despite your best efforts you may land up in a scenario where there is an excellent surgery has been done there is a pristine cornea there is a quiet eye but the patient still unhappy and he has landed with a high refractive error 
So what is, I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, optimization out here in details, which will be covered by another speaker, but basically our need is to hit the target. So remember to optimize your results. How you do it, probably a speaker who's talking about the optimization will talk about it. So I'm just skipping these slides. Uh, in the end, I will just like to summarize that while doing biometry, please keep in mind that both eyes should be measured at the same time. Always use the correct mode. Remember, most of the individuals, almost 92% of the individuals have excellence in this, uh, similar excellence, and they're in the range of 21 to 25.5 millimeters. So if you're going off these parameters, please recheck, recheck, recheck. Most corneas, are, again, are similarly regularly curved and similar between the two eyes. In 99% of the cases, they are in between 40 to 48 diopters. So if you're off these readings, please recheck, recheck, recheck. Look for asymmetry between both the characterometry and the excellence. And if there is asymmetry coming on repeated readings also, please think of conditions which are responsible for it, like a staphyloma, a vitreous lesion, or a corneal scarring, or an amblyopic eye. Repeat the measurements if the average corneal power, which I've already told, is less than 40 or greater than 48, or if the excellent is less than 22 or greater than 25, or if the difference in the excellent between the two eyes is greater than 0.3 mm, if the difference in the mean corneal power is greater than 0.9 diopters, difference in the emetropic implant power is greater than one diopters. Repeat on different days with different machines and use multiple formulas because obviously you're trying to minimize your errors. And always remember in case when you have to shift over during the surgery from an ink bag position to the sulcus position IOL, so obviously you'll have to change your IOL power accordingly. And for different diaptric pass, it's not the same that you always minus 0.5 diopter for each uh, whatever is the thing. For a uh, hypermetropic power, it is obviously more uh, difference would be there and for a myopic power, it would be less difference. Again, remember, if you are supposedly changing during the surgery an IOL, please remember to recalculate your powers at that time before you implant the IOL. And also, another thing which is important to remember is if you have done the optical and the ultrasonic measurements or you have done excellent measurements in different modes, there are different A constants for each IOL. So please ask your manufacturer for the A constant is different for an optical measurement and is different for an ultrasonic measurement. Remember that as well while doing your calculations. And always keep on auditing your own results for optimization. And special situations we'll be talking about in the next, uh, by the next speakers. So basically just remember these special situations. All these special situations require extra diligence when you're doing the calculations so, so that you can get the best of the refractive outcomes of your cataract patient. Thank you. Any questions anybody would like to ask? With contact inversion, doesn't change. it basically depends on the IOL. It's ultrasonic mode, whether you're doing the ultrasonic mode or whether you're doing with optical mode or the optical. And then you'll have to ask the manufacturer of that thing to give you, provide both the A constants. Most of the imported IELTS are giving that. Indian companies are not giving, but you can always ask for the company's uh, people to tell you the A constants for that. But remember to change it when you're doing your calculations because otherwise it makes a huge difference to your results. Go and call about the next speaker. I think Justin, probably you can speak up in between. I'll take up my next talk, pediatric biometry later. I'll invite upon the next speaker. She's talking about biometry in special situations. So she'll be covering most of the special situations, uh, except for the post uh, refractive and the post keratoplasty and the pediatric. Okay, so those situations will be covered by. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm going to be covering biometry in special situations. Our patients nowadays expect refractive outcomes from cataract surgery. Uh, I think Dr. Varati, Sashwat, you can also. So our patients are expecting refractive outcomes from surgery. And uh, in uh, uh, most of them, uh, the ones who have an average eye, we are able to provide in over 90% of the patients nowadays this result 
of uh, 0.5 diopters within target refraction if we are using the newer generation formulae and using optical biometers and personalizing our A constants. However, keep an eye for the unexpected, also look out for any inter-eye asymmetry and in such patients, uh, it is always important like Dr. Vinita said to repeat measurements. Uh, the keratometries can be done by maybe different machines. The uh, biometry should be repeated to uh, assess for any, uh, uh, you know, to come up with uh, any surprises. Uh, in these patients, it is important that we counsel them regarding the uh, 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 fact that they may not fall within the expected uh, 0.5 or 1 diopter range uh, and that they could be re requiring glasses post-surgery. So what exactly happens when the axial length uh, is very short or very long? Uh, the most important thing that happens is that the power that you are putting in the eye, the IOL power, its, its effectivity is dependent upon its position in the eye post-surgery. So this effective lens position is something that cannot be measured accurately prior, but it can be estimated. So uh, 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 it may not exactly fall uh, in the predictability range, especially for these extremes of axial length. Next is that the measurement should be accurate. So this is uh, made possible now with the newer generation optical biometers. And the third thing that is sometimes not in our control is that the IOLs that are available, their power may not exactly be their dioptric power may not exactly match what's printed on it. So the IOL availability and labeling issues are there. In the extreme ranges, the IOLs may not be available in the gap of 0.5 diopters, but rather 1 diopters. Uh, so the uh, newer, gen, uh, newer optical uh, biometers, they usually incorporate measurement of vari various parameters including the uh, lens thickness, the anterior chamber uh, uh, depth and they also take into account the preoperative refractive status of the eye and the patient's age. In addition to what we always measure, the axial length and the average K. The horizontal white to white is a very important variable which helps to determine the effective lens position. Uh, so uh, in the uh, uh, very long eyes, it is uh, important to, uh, if you are using the uh, ultrasound biometry, it is important to see that you are not taking the measurement at the uh, posterior stephyloma, but rather you are taking the refractive axial length. This uh, is, uh, there is a technique called the vector AB scan where the uh, B scan is taken along with the A scan so as to make sure that you are aligning your A scan at the fovea and not at the base of a stephyloma. Optical biometry has made our life very easy because we are able, the patient is able to fixate at the target and we are rest assured we can see that the measurements are being taken at the fovea. Another disadvantage of the um, uh, uh, contact uh, biomicroscopy is that uh, it could, uh, because of the low scleral rigidity, the errors in measurement would be higher. Uh, coming to calculating the IOLs in long eyes, uh, nowadays uh, it's ex uh, universally accepted, uh, easy one that we all have access to if we have the biometers, optical biometers is a Barrett universal tool. Uh, in uh, those, uh, it's recommended that uh, you can adjust the axial length in the uh, very highly myopic eyes. So if you have an axial length of more than 25, 26 millimeters, because of the longer vitreous cavity or the liquefied vitreous cavity, the refractive index standard that is being used in the IUL calculation formulae can lead to hyperopic surprises and therefore Wang and Koch have come up with an equation which is also available online that uh, you can put the values and adjust the axial length as use this adjusted axial length in the uh, calculation. Uh, in patients who have very, low, uh, very high myopia and are coming up with the IUL power of plus minus uh, 5 diopters, uh, it's recommended that you, the Hagis formula and the Hill RBF give a much better uh, results, more predictability. The short eyes are very, very unforgiving. 
Uh, not only is the uh, lens thick, it is present closer to the fovea and so even a small uh, change in the dioptric power or the small change in the axial length is going to cause a very high, uh, highly magnified error in uh, the refractive uh, post, post surgery refractive status. So, where when you are dealing with a short eye, please preferably go for an optical axial length measurement. And uh, uh, like for instance, if the axial length changes from just 20 to 19, the IUL power could change by a tune of 5 diopters. Uh, Hoffer Q is more accurate when you are using ultrasound biometry in these patients and the fourth generation formulae like the Holiday 2 and the Hagis are preferable. Uh, when, you, uh, when you have access to op, uh, the better uh, generation uh, formulae. Also, uh, the uh, uh, Barrett is universally accepted for all ranges of axial length. So, the Barrett is coming up with good predictability for short, long and the average eyes. This I have already discussed that uh, IUL availability could be an issue, the labeling could be an issue. And uh, a lot of us are going in for multi-formula comparison when you are dealing with these extreme uh, axial lengths and uh, this helps us to uh, uh, get a better idea of predictability. So, if you have two formulae which are recommended for that axial length and they are correlating with each other, the probability goes up uh, that the patient would be happy post-op. In the event that you are placing an IOL in the sulcus, the uh, correction is dependent on the dioptric range. So, if you have uh, uh, more high plus power lenses, the change in dioptric power required would be say 1.5, while it would be just 0.5 if it is in the 9 to 17 diopter range. Uh, to piggyback IOL, I think is going to be covered in the pediatric section. So, I would just uh, say that uh, this is something that uh, uh, can either be a primary or a secondary procedure and basically the calculation does just needs the refraction of the eye. Uh, in the silicon oil filled eyes, uh, the velocity of uh, sound uh, changes and uh, the conversion factor that is to be applied to the measured axial length is about 0.75. Mm -hmm. Optical biometry is certainly preferable because uh, that in, this, in that case you do not need to go for this correction factor. There you just uh, press the mode as the silicon oil filled eye. And uh, if you have to calculate a plano convex lens to be fitted in these eyes, there is a, a formula available and usually the power is about plus 3 stronger than that indicated by the standard calculation. In the aphakic eyes and the pseudophakic eyes, again there is no issue if you have the optical biometry. But in immersion biometry, even in pseudophakic eyes, it is better to just set it at the aphakic mode and uh, reduce the gain. Justine, can you be a little bit And the use the speed yeah. of 1532 meter per second. Uh, decide the position of the IOL, whether you are going to place it in the scleral fixation or in the AC IOL and uh, adjust the power accordingly. So, there are uh, a lot of formulae that are available now and there is a lot of interest uh, especially in the fourth generation formulae like the HEL RBF and the Olsen and of course, till that time in the if you have the IUL master, uh, you can use the multi formula strategy you uh, could uh, we are finding that Barrett is usually working fairly well in these patients and always always counsel them preoperatively. Uh, especially if they are going in for uh, higher end uh, uh, lenses about the uh, possible chance of requiring glasses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jasleen. Any questions for the audience? Okay, then we will come to the next talk which is about the optimization as I was talking about in my talk. So, I will invite Dr. Shalini Mohan to talk about IL power optimization how to optimize your own results so as to get the best refractive outcome. Do you have a presentation? Yeah. Shalini, maybe. I'm in the hall, not in the... 
Maybe we don't write. Thank Dr. Vinita for the opportunity about optimizing the IOL power. Well, just now we have heard Dr. Vinita saying, and we all agree with it also, that cataract surgery has become equivalent to refractive surgery. Now, the biggest and the strongest factor is the intraocular lens. More importantly, it is not just the lens, but it is actually the IOL power calculation. Till now, when we talk of IOL formulas, the best formula available till now were the third generation, and now the newer generations have come up. About third generation, Holiday 1 was working best for the average eyes, SRK2 for the longer eyes, and Hoffer Q for the shorter eyes. We were using two input variables, keratometry and axial length, and we were trying to predict the effective lens position. So this was the major pitfall in all these formulae, that on the basis of axial length and keratometry, the effective lens position was being protected, which is actually the distance from the posterior part of the cornea, posterior surface of the cornea to the lens. Now this explains the position of the IOL post-operatively. But definitely it is difficult because IOL is obviously thinner than cataract. Then anterior chamber depth tends to increase with pseudophagia and sometimes it varies with surgeon to surgeon also. So this assumption of effective lens position doesn't hold true, especially because it assumes that as short eyes, the eyes with shorter axial length will have shorter anterior chamber depth or vice versa. But in human eyes, we do realize that anterior and posterior segment of human eyes are often not proportional. It is not essential that a longer eye will always have a deeper, deeper anterior chamber depth. So the main limitation of all these IL power calculations was this effective lens pred position prediction. So what to do to have a highly accurate IL power? Surgeon, they can optimize then each component or we can use the newer generation formula. So I will be talking about optimization. Now we need to optimize each and every component which we are using for IL power calculation. We know that if there is an error at keratometry, it reflects at the spectacle pane and plane in the ratio of one is to one. So we need to maximize our keratometry reading. So always use to, you try to use single instrument for all your pre-operative and post-operative measurements. If you're using auto K, it requires multiple readings and take the average. Regularly check the calibration of your instruments. If the readings are not reliable and you feel Myers are not reliable, then it is better to put a drop of lubricant. And obviously, keratometry should be done first without, uh, the cornea shouldn't be, have been touched with any other instrument. And if you have any doubt, always correlate with your topography so that if there is any subtle finding like maybe a form of keratoconus, you don't tend to miss it. Now, about axial length, which is a very common reason to get a wrong IL power, as uh, just now we had our talk that immersion biometry is preferable to any contact biometry because with, immer with contact we do applinate the cornea which might result into errors and therefore immersion biometry is preferred. But when we talk of precision, it is the optical biometer because these optical biometer actually measure the refractive axial length. They calculate the axial length up till the macula, whereas in ultrasonic, what we are getting is the anatomical axial length and that can vary. Suppose you are having a stephyloma, that can measure a wrong axial length also. So to, uh, we need a good optical biometer and in fact accuracy is almost 10 times to the ultrasonic axial length measurement. And then finally, we all need to optimize our own A constant. The manufacturers may give other readings, but what we are getting in our post-operative patient, we need to optimize them. In holiday one, it is the surgeon's factor which is being optimized. In SRKT, uh, it is A constant. In Hoffer's Q, it is um, the anterior chamber depth, post-operative anterior chamber depth. In Haggis, it is A0, A1, and A2. 
Now, if we talk of optimization, it is slightly a complex process, but if you want to optimize your Haggis constant, you can simply go on the drhill.com. That is actually a very good website. You try to explore the website and you will get so many new things on it and you can optimize your Haggis A0, A1 and A2 constant. Now this is an interesting method to optimize your A constant by Aristodemao method where you tra track your preoperative axial length, preoperative keratometry, also put in the IOL model which you are using and the power and the current IOL constant you are using and then subtract your post-operative refraction from the predicted refraction and you get prediction error and on the basis of prediction error you can actually uh, optimize your A constant. If you are getting hyperopic error, prediction error is hyperopic, that means you need to increase your IL constant and vice versa. If you are getting a myopic prediction error, decrease your IL constant. Now this is another method which is the grid method where we create a grid of 3 into 3. Here axial length is divided into short, medium and long and keratometry is also divided into flat, medium and steep. But because it is a bit complicated, I won't go too much into details. Now if you are actually serious about optimization, this is a very interesting website which is user group for laser interference biometry which is the ULIB. Now here you get all can I have the pointer? So you can see that all the, uh, uh, if you open this website, there are so many names of all the biometers. What, whichever biometer you are having, you simply have to click that. And once you click that, what you get is another uh, page where you can enter your all your data in the form of Excel sheet. Now here, what you get in Excel sheet, you need to enter interior chamber depth, axial length, K1 and K2, IOL. Uh, it is important that the all these readings should be for one single IOL. You cannot put different uh, IOLs reading here in one Excel sheet. Now once you have filled in at least the data of 50 patients, then what you can do, you can email to this email ID, it is already written over here. Here you can email or you can give it to the representative also and then you will get the your a constant optimization and then you can use that A constant for that particular make of the IOL which you, for which you have re uh, entered the readings. Finally, once you have optimized your A constant, one more thing which needs to be optimized and which is known as surgeon's factor is the configuration of capsular axis. So you need to have a good centered capsular axis which is covering the IOL from 360 degree and equal coverage is very, very important because suppose the um, diameter is larger and the IOL is rising up. Obviously the effective lens position has changed. The, now the post-operative refractive error would be myopic for all these patients. So the axis rules says that the capsular axis should be round centered and covering the optics all around. So to conclude I would say that minimize the number of variables. So try to use a single instrument. Verify, uh, verify all your measurements whenever necessary. Immersion ultrasound is preferred only if optical biometry is not coming but prefer optical biometry. Carefully track all your records and optimize your own lens constant and then create a round central and circular capsular axis. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Wonderful talk, Dr. Shalini. Are there any questions here regarding this talk? Yes, please. So uh, once you have done you with your surgery, right? In post-operative period, change the mode in the pseudo-phakic mode. And if you have used acrylic IOL, make it acrylic. Now whatever the anterior chamber depth you are getting is the post-operative anterior chamber depth. And that you can feed in. That is the depth from the uh, cornea to the anterior surface of IOL. That I will repeat in the next biometry. Yeah, I'm after...
You have to use the endo ACD. Endo ACD AC depth of the preoperative parameter of the eye. And I am telling you that that is the depth of the in, uh, in endothelium. From the endothelium, endothelium to, to the anterior the surface of the, the anterior uh, capsule, yes. Or, 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 anterior yes, capsule. yes. But what is a calculation measurement that is the endothelial depth to the uh, IUL yeah, anterior yeah. surface? That Actually, is not uh, yeah, yeah. because IUL is much less That is the postoperative anterior chamber depth, so but no, you are doing a preoperative. What is the guideline? Because the parent formula, there is a uh, guideline for to put the AC depth. Now, uh, uh, let me answer this. Now, uh, whenever we are using optical biometer, it is from the posterior surface of cornea we are measuring anterior chamber depth. Whenever you are using immersion, it is from the anterior surface of cornea, or ultrasonic biometer measures from the anterior segment of cornea. So you need to subtract the pachymetry reading if you are using ultrasonic biometer. Oh. For optical biometry, you can feed in directly over there in the biometer. Yeah. But formulas it determined by the artificial lens, artificial pseudo fake lens. So that, that, that is that, that, that doesn't match with the, this lens. No, so no, for, exactly. For, uh, there is a guide. There should be any guideline because there is a parent to formula. What lens? Composition is not calculated. Estimate the artificial. I am not telling. For if I want to calibrate by the parent to formula, what ACDF shall I put? That I want to know. Because there is a uh, space is there, parent to formula, K1, K2, axial length, and your AC depth, post so, it, it, so in Barrett's, you... So it is the anterior chamber depth which has been calculated by the machine. You can simply put in that anterior chamber from the optical biometer. Yeah, and lens thickness is also calculated by a biometer. You, that you can input. Yeah. If uh, that's enough, may I request Dr. Vanathi to please uh, give a talk on toric aisles. Dr. Vanathi needs no introduction. You know, most of all us are merely ophthalmologists. Vanathi is a celebrity. We all know her. <laughs> from <coughs> she's from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, thank you. I think Vinita is out, and uh, thank you for uh, including me in this nice uh, biometry course. So uh, my topic is uh, talking to you about how you refine torics with the use of uh, intraoperative aberometry. Currently, this is the only thing which we have in our alma mater to refine our results when we are performing uh, premium IOL uh, surgeries. I have no financial interest in the mention of use of any of the uh, devices or equipments through the course of this talk here. So what we have uh, with us right now is known as the ORA or what it, uh, what it means is the OptiWave refractive analysis and uh, this equipment has this particular console which can be attached on to your operating microscope and it also has this uh, standing cart here which has an inbuilt CPU with the software embedded onto it and uh, we use the operating microscope to image the uh, uh, image and uh, do the imaging to calculate an intraoperative refraction of the patient while we are operating after we've extracted the lens after we performed your fecal emulsification and 
it gives you a prediction of the IOL power which you need to use for this particular case to be put, to be put in here. The only only difficulty with this it is of course and a sophisticated expensive equipment here and this occupies a significant amount of your space uh, between the eye and up to the operating microscope. So there is a sterile cover which is there so the surgeon needs to surgeon gets a little intimidated because you are not you do not have the freedom of space of moving your equipments the way you would otherwise uh, be moving around in uh, in a surgery without the aura as such. I won't go into much of the theory but much of it is already available if you want to read about it in the net but just to, to touch upon the opticus how this aura system works it images light on into the eye here and the light gets reflected back from the retina here producing a wavefront by passing it through a system of optics of this particular device here and this produces a particular wavefront image by passing it through a, a pair of, of grids which are placed at a particular, uh, gra the gratings are placed at a particular angle between each other to produce a significant fringe pattern. This fringe pattern is captured by a camera and is analyzed through a complex formula system based on which the refraction, the phacic refraction of the particular eye is given to you. And based on this refraction, the IOL which is going to be best suited for this eye is then given. So this is the particular uh, system, the aura system. And we, when we use it in combination with Im image guided system, such as the such as very on this becomes the verify system and this currently is the most sophisticated or the most uh, well-developed system which we have with us to predict uh, the accuracy of our IOL power which we are implanting here. This gives you a continuous assessment of the patient's refraction throughout when we are doing the procedure and uh, it can predict the IOL sphere accurately, the cylinder and the axis as which you have to align when you are doing premium IOLs such as toric or multifocal or multifocal toric IOLs here. So this is uh, the top of the line uh, device which we have out here here and when you look this is how it is going to uh, this is the image we generally have to switch off the uh, the microscope light and then do the capturing of the image and you can see particularly here the patient has to fix the one other thing is you will have to do all your surgeries under topical for this particular because the patient needs to fix into the fixating light for accurate alignment of the optical system of the image capture here and when the patient is fixing out here and then you do you you put on the capture button here and then it captures the image and it displays the amount of a phacic refraction and gives you the prediction of the best possible IOL power. So you can you can take a series of about two or three um, uh, captures during uh, during this and based on what you're getting you could uh, then select from your inventory uh, the accurate IOL which you have for which you need for this particular patient. The downside of this system is you also need to have a well stocked inventory here. Again, the downside is the current commercial available systems do not give you steps lesser than 0.5 in terms of uh, diopters, in terms of spherical powers, in terms of uh, sphere. So that is the limitation to which you can use this device, though you can refine your, st your spheres and cylinders to the level of 0.1 and 0.2. Uh, so this is the accuracy or this is the range which you have. It can measure over a range of, of minus 5 to plus 20. The sphere accuracy can be taken down right up to about 0.25 and the, and the repeatability when you do is up to, is about 0.13. The cylinder accuracy is of 0.2 to 0.5 here can vary of course depending upon it does have a significant learning curve and the surgeon needs how to uh, learn to use it otherwise your measurements can be erroneous as well. So what does it actually do and how does it enhance the outcome of the astigmatic uh, of, of, of any particular cases here? It is particularly useful in astigmatic patients and in post lasic patients by giving a real-time estimation of the cylinder, the amount of cylinder and the magnet and the axis of the cylinder, it helps you to refine or optimize the outcome of the surgery which you are doing. It estimates the total corneal power here, so which means it takes into account the, the 
posterior corneal astigmatism, which today is now considered as one of the most important aspects, especially when you're moving on to do, uh, you're going to do premium IOL surgeries here. So it helps you to decrease the amount of postoperative refractive surprises here. And uh, this is how it can be of, uh, put, to, uh, put to best use when you're using in special scenarios, especially in very long eyes, in eyes with high astigmatism, in eyes with post-refractive surgery procedures here. These are some of the, uh, the, of the grid patterns which you see. And this is the image which you'll see on the image cart here. And when you're off axis, it's going to tell you in which axis you need to rotate your toric IOL. And once you've achieved the optimal position and image again, it's going to give you an NRR means no further rotation is required in this particular case here. It, due to lack of time, I think I will not run through, run you through um, uh, much of the other theory here, but why are we making such a big fuss about this in, uh, in toric IOLs? It's because a three degrees misalignment can decrease the effectivity of your uh, postoperative uh, results by 10% and the 10 degrees can go as, as high as, high as um, 30, 33%. So that's why it's particularly useful in cases where you're looking at higher astigmatism, post lassic cases and higher toric power. So uh, I'm just going to run you uh, one of my patient's clips here. And uh, after after having performed the, the FACO emulsification, this is an IOL which we have put in and uh, I'm imaging after the IOL has been put in to see the accuracy. This is the fringe pattern which appears on and you have to see the uniformity of the fringe here to see if you are in the correct position and in the correct alignment here. And it gives you a selection or a range of IOLs here. And you'll have to learn how to uh, to tailor it or to optimize it to the best needs of the uh, of the of the particular eye which you are dealing with. And that's where you've seen and you've rotated back into position, you're able to see an NRR. The latest Varion suits do have incorporated the total corneal astigmatism as well in these uh, patients here, uh, in, in these formulas today. So the latest systems we have, which we have with us today can probably give us the best possible accuracy than what we had uh, earlier. A few words of advice or caution for those of you who would be using it is that you need a, a good operating microscope with optimal illumination. The patient needs to be fixing properly here and um, uh, IOP needs to be in the higher physiological range when you're doing these, in these uh, when you are capturing images and you'll have to take care of any factor which causes corneal disturbances like the uh, speculum pressure, the surface drying, viscoelastics present on the surface, corneal haze, the system does not work very well and the patient's tilt and positioning is not correct, your image capture could be uh, not correct as well. I think in lack of time, I would not run you through the examples which I have here. And uh, if we have time, perhaps we can get back to see how our uh, post-operative results feature in a couple of our uh, cases and uh, how it really helps us to refine our uh, results in terms of uh, toric IOLs and multifocal toric IOLs. Thank you for your patient hearing. Uh, biometry in patients who've had refractive surgery, a topic that interests uh, all of us uh, with increasing number of uh, such patients now coming for cataract mm -hmm. surgery. He is with Shroff Eye Center in Delhi. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, let me welcome you to this topic, post-refractive surgery idle power calculations, which can alternately be called as uh, biometry from hell also. The calculations are so difficult. And let me welcome you, and along with me, this lady here, Sh Sharbat Gula, from the land of from the land of the radial keratotomy. This is not very well. Now, what is the problem? Why are there so many problems in a post-RK or a post-radial keratotomy, uh, LASIK uh, IL power? There are basically three problems. Unlike Apollo 13, we have three different problems. The first one is the least of all instrument error. The second is keratomy index error, quite a sufficient one. The most important is the formula error. There are three different problems to be solved here. The first one is the instrument error. What is the problem with instrument error? Is most of the instruments, they measure the paracentral cornea, not the center, which is about 2.5 to 3 millimeters and therefore misses the central flatter zone, which is actually what is the refractive surgery doing. So it measures this middle. You can see this here. 
and the central fat is zone in a post myopic or a more hyperopic would be more steep so it misses that entirely and estimates oh, like this you know this is normal but what the catamid is doing is here so it is measured the paracentral not the center similarly in hypermetropes it is the steep place we totally missed and therefore it our it estimates overestimates by almost 15 to 25 percent which is quite a bit this is not a major problem because the ablation zones are very large now six millimeters so it is compensated the second problem is considerable one because this is a index of refraction fiction so the fiction thing is that we always assume the index of refraction corner to be 1.375 so sorry it's gone back and this is not really 1.375 it was done historically so that a 7.5 radius could correspond to 45 millimeter for affordable adapter and also assumes that the ratio of anti to posterior radius is constant which is approximately 82 percent this is not true as it changes as you can see here it changes because now the anti surface is getting uh, ablated and in hypermetropia similarly anti surface getting ablated the, obviously the ratio is not the same anymore and this is not true at all and this overestimates again the coronal power so this is a sufficiently important error which we have to take care of and the third one to, to solve these two errors to solve these errors we have to do directly coronal power measurements which can be done by either obscan or pentacam or oct whatever you have we have do octs mostly or pentacam is now very important and what it does it overcomes this measuring curves of both the surface rather than the anterior it covers both the surfaces all these three instruments both the surfaces, particularly the pentacam, which you now you can use the lovely Schimmflug image, capturing 25,000 points in two seconds, and we use the EKR. EKR is 4.5 equivalent carrying the five different maps of the pentacam. We use the EKR. 4.5 millimeter zone gives for the best central corner power. By this too, we can overcome the first two problems. The third problem, so this is the EKR reading, and the third problem is the formula. So the third generation so-called American formula. American formula because of Hoffer Q, Holidays, SRK2, they all predict the ELP. We talked about ELP, Dr. Shalini took a wonderful talk on that. Predicted by the axial length and the keratometry. Now, because the K is flat, so automatically we assume that the ELP is more anteriorly. Now, this is not actually true because there's actually no change in antechamber depth. And this you can see, this is the ELP, okay, measured by keratometry. But a flatter keratometry does not assume that it should be anteriorly. Actually, there's no push change in position at all. So to this problem, what do we do? This gives an incorrect IL power calculation, and we have to adjust this IL formula. They, otherwise, the flat central corner will underestimate the IL power. We do this in two different ways. Either you have a very expensive holiday IL consultant, or you apply the double K correction method. The double K correction method we apply because most of the formulas use the keratometry twice. One, to predict the IL power. Second, to predict the ELP. So we have to estimate this double K correction method. and this is the Hagus does not require double K because it does not use keratometry as a predicting factor for ELP. Now, this is the famous paper, the landmark paper, which you should all remember, Adam Berry's. Let me give you a good example, quick example, in a shortage of time. And this is a study of, a uh, real study, of course, a pre operative keratometry of 45, post refractive surgery became 36, and axial length of 24.5 with an anti chamber depth of. Uh, I have a good tangible. Let's say we want to put 118.9 A constant. We're aiming for emetropia using holiday one. And the formula we get, the IOL power we get, the IOL power we get without a double K is 26.6. Okay? But if we use a double K correction, the IOL power comes out to be 29.37. This lands up with a patient of almost three diapters hypermetropic, an extremely unhappy patient. So you see with the power of the double K. So these are the ways we take care of the three problems and now but which formula you know, there's so many of them and life is too short for all of them so what we do is to go to the online calculator many of them freely available the most publicized and the most popular is the Ascaris one so you go to this is free I will power calculator fill up the forms there's plenty of observations and based on the number of observation as you fill up each up what it does it calculates multiple calculations and let's see a quick uh, calculation. So pre elastic refraction is minus 11.25 with the post elastic minus 2.25. Pre elastic carrier 42, post elastic 36. Axial length is 28 millimeter, AC depth 3.5 millimeter. These are the things. Now, see what happens when we apply the calculation method. Now, the corneal, correct coronal power, remember, coronal correct power is different from the refractive power 
at the corner level, pre-class refraction is actually 9.91, not 11.25, that's refraction, this is at the corner level. Post-class it will be 2.91, not 2.25, and the change in corner is about 7.72. And therefore the corrected case is not really 42, I'm not 36, but 42 point minus 7.72 is 34, this is 35.2, and, and what we had taken was 36. Shasha, can you lift, uh, hurry up? Lift yeah, I've yeah. I just Sorry got... For the uh, and finally, so when we feed all this, using multiple formulae, see all the formulas give us almost a single result. We're using a clinical history method, double K and SRK, we get 20.6. Shamas gives us 20.4. Hyagis gives 20.81. And Masket gives us 20.6 with a consensus of 20.6. So we put a 21 diopter IOL, and this is the final result. Look at that, 0.5 in the only. A very happy patient and a very happy doctor. Last one quickly, keratometry, I'll just take quickly. I've been very little time now. Keratometry is this is the land of real keratometry. Remember, there are multiple problems. I am not going to talk about this. Let me just tell you. The major problem is that RK never stops. Throughout your life, the cornea incisions flatten and the hypertrop is infinite hypermetropic drift, sometimes years, which can go up to three diopters because of constant flattening. The second thing is the diurnal fluctuations. The patient wakes up with hypermetropia and becomes emetropic by sunset. That is because in the morning, because of the corneal flattening by the lid pressure, and absence of evaporation, the cornea is flatter. So he wakes up hypermetropic, and by the night he's, at 2 o'clock actually, from 2 p.m. onwards, he starts getting emetropia. So we don't know what time to take the keratometry. Plus the lens induced myopia is the third problem. Look at this case report. Before the, we got into the IL power calculations. A 43-year-old male with a cat left eye, 17 years RK, for minus 11 diopter, 8 cuts RK, this is what it looked like. And so post-op refraction, pre-op, beg your pardon, before the cataract was minus 2.5 with a minus 4 cylinder. K1 52, K2 38.5, IL power cal axial 30.5 with the SRK formula was 1.5 diopter IOL. But the surgeon chose to play it safe and added 3.5 extra, trying to get rid of the hypermetry, 3.5. So he implanted 5 and look at the post-op refraction, 12 diopters spherical and a minus two. Despite posing a 3.5 extra, he landed with 12.5. All these are published reports, and this is the condition of the surgeon the next day. So that is what is happening here. So to finally, we go back to our online calculator. Again, we have a prior RK. This thing is to be fed, and we get an IL power calculation, which is close enough. And last point, what are the things that I can tell you from my own points, is aim for myopia to 0.5 to minus one. There's no need to aim for emetropia hemat here. Barrett's true K and Shama's PL are the most accurate as far as we've been able to make out. Multifocal dials are not to be encouraged at all. And negative spherical dials, which means uh, a axis of IQ, is preferred. And finally, I think we should all pray before the surgery. Thank you very much. I think we'll have to cut short on our talk, so we'll just talk about the refractive surprise because that's what everybody is afraid of. So I'll just we'll try to cover it in the next two three minutes because we'll have to cut short of the, because of the short of time. So we'll probably have to cut through the next two talks: the pediatric biometry and the post keratoplasty. If you have any yeah. personal questions, you can ask related to that. Hmm. I'd like to thank Dr. Vinita for giving me a chance to be part of this wonderful course. Can we have the lights off? So you've done all of these things, but you still ended up with a problem, right? So how to fix that? So as, uh, it's, as a proper popularly said, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. All these situations that we've talked about for the last uh, few, several minutes, we have to be extra careful and uh, take all the precautions that were mentioned by the previous speakers to make sure we get an accurate spot on biometry. But if, in spite of all your measures, you end up with a refractive surprise, it is a surprise, and nobody likes to see a bad uh, auto ref reading like this on the first post-operative day or week, whatever. So uh, some of the common causes are uh, capsular distension syndrome, which will cause a myopic shift uh, if you've left too much viscoelastic in the bag. IOL malposition, um, either a tilt or a, uh, uh, if the lens is in the sulcus, or if it's a toric IOL, if it's rotated, or if there's a phimosis, which has shifted the effective lens position. Biometry errors, of course, uh, if something, or an entry error, or a procedural error, you put a wrong lens for the wrong patient. Options essentially are IOL exchange, piggyback lenses, 
or you can do a cornea based correction like a surface laser or a LASIK. If the cause is like a capsular distension, then you, can, you have to release the viscoelastic from the bag either by yagging the anterior capsule or the posterior capsule or washing the viscoelastic out. If the IOL is not in correct place, you need to put it back either by rotating it or putting it into the bag. So if you see this, please check it, go back and check everything. Uh, recheck the IOL calculation in pseudophagic mode, check your preoperative data, len lens power calculation, see where you've gone wrong and uh, try to correct that so that doesn't happen next time. Make sure that the right patient has the right lens and rule out a capsular block syndrome if you have a myopic surprise. Very often we don't look, think about this and that's something which is very, very easily uh, treatable. Suppose the patient has had a multifocal lens and is coming in the first month or so, IOL exchange can easily be done. But if it's very long, then probably better not to try and fiddle with the bag, especially if you have a hydrophobic lens and put a lens on top of your existing lens if there's enough place and the endothelium is okay. And that's what a piggyback lens is. You can, of course, uh, laser-based options are always available too, but then they come with a cost. Um, monofocal lenses, again, similar. Uh, IOL exchange, piggyback lenses, or surface laser in the first four weeks. Uh, beyond that, then um, piggyback lenses are uh, a better option. Just a word of caution, if you're thinking of doing a LASIK in a patient who's had a cataract surgery, especially if you're thinking of doing a femtolasic, make sure that the hinge of your femtolasic is at the wound site. Otherwise, you'll, uh, you can have a vertical gas break breakthrough at that point if the flap edge is coming there. Toric IOLs, if they get rotated, if you have the old calculations, just go back and see the chart and put the lens in the correct axis. Otherwise, you can use this website called astigmatismfix.com. And if you have an eye trace aberometer, that also has a mode in which you can calculate how much to rotate the lens to kind of fix uh, the uh, refractive surprise. Um, again, uh, you can uh, also use, if it's extreme uh, and you're not sure of the preoperative data, you could do an IOL exchange or a piggyback lens on top. You can put another toric on top of a toric that's been reported, and you could use an exam laser also. Uh, if the problem is uh, of a, uh, if you're thinking of doing a lens exchange, a good idea would be to put, uh, put your lens into the sulcus or into the anterior chamber, and then put your new lens in the bag first, and then you cut the other lens and remove it. And uh, that's uh, make to make sure that you don't damage the capsule in the process of removing your first lens. Um, this is an interesting, just a couple of cases I'll share with you. Uh, interesting case, uneventful cataract surgery, Im immediate post-op refractive surprise, uh, two diopters. And you can see at the edge of the lens, you can see an outline. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it. And I was suspecting that this could be a capsular distension syndrome because I could see a gap between the posterior optic and the posterior capsule. So uh, indeed there was some which was confirmed by the OCT. You can see that gap between the posterior optic and the, the thing. So uh, if you do not remove this viscoelastic, this will not really get cleared. So you need to yag the capsule. You could either yag the peripheral capsule uh, anteriorly or you can yag the posterior capsule. So in this case, I didn't, uh, since it was early post-op, I decided to yag the anterior capsule and you can see that little aperture we have created superiorly, pointer here, and um, no problem. Ah, here I so you can see that little star-shaped opening we created and that let out the viscoelastic into the anterior chamber. Same thing you can see on retro illumination, a more magnified view of that opening. So uh, everything got okay. And uh, if not this, you can yak the posterior capsule. Sometimes the peripheral yak doesn't work. Uh, and then you have to yak the posterior capsule also, or you can go back and wash. Uh, a thorough wash of OVD would prevent this kind of a problem, especially behind the lens. This was another patient. She had a multifocal lens. You can see with time she had a phimosis uh, and also a significant hyperopic surprise. This hyperopic surprise was the early post-op also. Um, and then she was lost to follow up and then she came back with this. The hyperopic surprise had increased a little bit. So obviously the problem was of a um, biometry error plus the phimosis also had shifted the lens anteriorly and perhaps that was also contributing. So it was planned for a piggyback toric uh, and there was a significant cylinder as well. So we planned for a piggyback toric sulco fix which is from IOCare. We also have another sulco uh, flex lens available from Rayner. Both of these are for piggyback purpose. That's what this lens looks like. So it's got a four haptic uh, four point fixation. So 
you can see the significant amount of phimosis and you can see the multifocal lens is otherwise well centered. So we just uh, kind of used a scissor to um, kind of enlarge the capsule opening like so. And then essentially inflated the uh, sulcus with viscoelastic and put this lens, this you can see it's got four haptics and uh, you just put it into a cartridge injector and um, inject it into the bag, into the sulcus and gradually nudge the four haptics in place. Uh, you needn't really do a, per a peripheral aridectomy, but if you want to be safe, you can do one. And you can see we uh, managed to enlarge that uh, capsule opening and put the lens there. You can see the gap between the first uh, lens and the second lens on the slit. So uh, we'll not, not go into this. So just I'll just tell you how to do the calculation. If it's a hyperopic error, whatever is a refractive error, multiply by 1.5, that gives you the lens power to be used. If it's a myopic error, multiply by 1.2, and that's the power that you could use. Sulcoflex from Rayner is the other lens, and you can see that the angulation uh, is such that uh, it will not cause a pupillary uh, block. So to conclude, refractive surprises are best prevented by good biometry practices and surgical safety practices. Uh, but if it happens, it's not a big deal. It can be easily treated by cornea and lens based procedures uh, with good outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for li uh, patient listening. And I'm s uh, my apologies to the next uh, sessions of the next uh, 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 s all the speakers and the chairperson of the next session for uh, shooting our time. Thank you.